All right, it is Wednesday night here on Twitch. And for Green Oaks Gaming, I'm Joe. Wednesday nights are when we generally just take inspiration from miniatures and create a character. I've been promising for a couple of weeks that we would shift gears a little bit and do something for the GM specifically and not create a player character, but rather a character that the GM can use in an encounter. You can see on the big screen there, I've got my player's handbook. That's more just for a thumbnail than anything else. But I've also got my monster manual, as well as my encounter builder sheet, and a couple of miniatures in bags along with pencil. I do also have near me a pen because I do like to put the details of my character sheets in pen and then use pencil as I'm going through encounters so I can adjust things and erase and reuse if I so choose. So today I, I debated a lot on which miniature I was going to uh, feature if I wanted to do something large or something small. And I actually just waited until right before the stream, I dug into my Dungeon Dwellers uh, box from Bones Kickstarter 5 from Reaper Miniatures and just picked out something that I thought was kind of cool for possibly a campaign that I'm writing on Mondays currently. So this is going to be a lower uh, level encounter or a mid-tier, I would say a level 1 to 4 encounter that will utilize this uh, creature out of and build them up just based off of adjustments out of the monster manual with some guidance on the miniature itself and how we'll use them in our game world. So without any further ado, you can see there are two miniatures here and both of them are goblins on wargs. So basically the only difference is one has a scimitar, one has an axe. And I thought I would do these both as one um, encounter sheet. So initially I grabbed two, but I'm actually going to put them on just one sheet. And the reason I did that, I thought they both, the miniatures, I thought they were pretty cool. Um, I don't have any goblins riding wargs aside from these miniatures out of Bones 5. And they were both, I mean, just right next to each other in the box. So it worked out perfectly, and it immediately got me thinking, ooh, what if they are brothers? And that kind of got me thinking a little bit of, do I have these two be kind of the head of the charge? Or maybe it's for a lower level, just a single encounter with just two of them and no other goblins. Are they directing traffic, so to say, with foot soldier goblins? You can scale this a lot of different ways. So I thought, why not start with both of the goblins in one um, encounter sheet and put some backstory to it, build out some stats that are cool and interesting and unique and different, and make this a very cool, excitable piece. So I'm going to adjust the cameras here a little bit. Oh, a little bit heavy there. <laughs> That's okay. Let's adjust the camera this way so that when I slide in here, I'm still on screen a little bit. I guess not a whole ton. We'll fix that a little bit. But I don't think you're interested in seeing me as much as you are the work that we're going to do. So these are the miniatures. These are both plastic cast. So silo cast, I believe. Um, but the bones, the newer bones material that holds detail really, really well. Now you can see these goblins are already affixed onto the wargs, so I don't have to worry about gluing them or anything. And they're actually pretty good goblin sculpts. Um, I don't remember who sculpted these. It may be Jason Weeby, but I'm not positive of that. If not, I apologize to the proper artist. Um, but yeah, very good sculpts on both the wargs and the goblins, the goblins especially. I like it when the goblins have a lot of facial detail, uh, good musculature. For such a small miniature, it's, it's not often you see this level of detail in there. Um, so really pretty cool. 
Uh, like I said, weapon-wise, one has a scimitar, one has an axe. And for their base, they're just on like cobblestone bases, uh, which is kind of the new broccoli base, I guess. But I would rather have the cobblestone than the broccoli any day because you can then use these in cities and things like that. You can still go over it with detailing stuff to make it look more outdoors if you choose, uh, however you decide to do the base. But the miniatures themselves, uh, Goblins on Wargs, that is the path we're going to take today, and we are going to build out encounters based on these uh, Goblins on Wargs. So I have got my character sheet, and this is just one that I use for my monsters. I fill it out in pen, that way I can reuse it however often I choose, and just make adjustments um, in pencil as I'm going through the encounter itself. And to start out, I actually am going to start with the goblins, though the other sheet is going to be the wargs, and I will keep these sheets together. Um, ultimately, I should have printed some of these two-sided just for uh, this type of occasion where I've got multiple foes because the wargs themselves are going to be uh, an encounter, basically, uh, a uh, foe on the battlefield. So we will go to goblins. And I'm not going to go through all the history of goblins themselves, uh, just because a lot of people in their own game worlds have different variances on history of goblins and all of that. So we're not going to dive much into that. Um, but then we have to start deciding, are these going to be goblin bosses or just goblins? So my first thought is, if we make both of these goblin bosses, that gives us a CR1 each. And when you have two of them plus two wargs, you're automatically making this a tougher encounter. So you're not looking at just two CR1 uh, encounters um, or one CR2, basically. So it is something that you'll have to think about as you're going through. I recommend checking out my uh, adventure planner that we showed off in the last video from Monday. And you can probably find it on my YouTube as well as if you want to download it. Uh, you can get that from my Patreon if you're a patron. So we are going to put in here, um, I'm going to do a quick, real quick, I'm going to do just a quick, you know what, we'll actually do it via phone. That way we can keep it on screen and you can see, I am just going to do a quick Google search for goblin name generator. And I'm just gonna pick two names off of this list and those will be our goblins. So I like crags and bleeds. And these are going to be goblin bosses. Just like that. We've got a little bit of name already. They're kind of funky. Um, a little bit different. So these are going to be uh, small humanoid. And they're going to be neutral evil. All about themselves whatever the cost. And we are going to do armor class. These are going to be 17. And then hit points, we're going to do our average of 21 or 6d6. And then here we're going to do crags. And here we're going to do bleaks. And that will be 36 hit points each if we go with the maximum. Uh, their speed is 30 feet, 
but then I'm going to put a parenthesis here, or not a parenthesis, a dash, a backslash. And the reason I'm doing that is going to put riding, because they are mounted, we will have to get that wolf's speed in there. And then we're just going to go out and fill out the stats just like they are in the book to start. And get all of their stats done. Now skills, they have stealth plus six. And this is where I'm going to start changing things up. They are riding. So I also am going to give them uh, an animal handling. plus three. And we're already starting to elevate these out of just their standard stat blocks. Senses, they've got dark vision of 60 feet and their passive perception is nine. Now remember your stat blocks out of the monster manual are just for your everyday run of the mill encounter uh, monster or foe or what have you. So for this goblin boss, out of the stat book, this is just an everyday average goblin boss. So take the liberty to adjust. Um, the book tells you to do that as a GM. So languages, they have common and goblin. And then their CR is one and that's just right out of the manual I would actually update this a little bit probably to a two once we're all done tactics they do have nimble escape so that just means they can take disengage or hide as a bonus action which I love the disengage Um, and then actions, they get multi-attack. But it gets even better once we get into this um, encounter building. So the goblin makes two attacks with its scimitar. The second attack has disadvantage. And that's how they try to balance it a little bit. by imposing that disadvantage. So we know for crags, oh, as a scimitar, as we see on that miniature, a nice scimitar in hand, ready to go. And that is going to be a melee with a plus four to hit five foot reach, one target. And that deals 1d6 plus two slashing. Now, Bleegs has an ax on his miniature. He does not have a scimitar. No scimitar. So what I want to do is just pull up my equipment and just verify what that damage is. So I'm just uh, popping on to D&D Beyond and going to my rules and the equipment and we're going to search up axe. We've got a battle axe right here can see that's 1d8 slashing. Which is also a melee and a plus four to hit. Five foot reach, 
one target, 1d8 plus 2 slashing. So Bleegs is going to hit a little bit harder with that axe, a little bit harder. But to offset, I'm going to have Crags actually be a little bit more crafty in the way that he does it. So I'm going to make myself a note here that Crags uses combat tactics. So as I'm moving him around the map in my encounter, I know he's going to be a little bit smarter. So I'm going to do a plus one to intelligence when needed. And that's just to offset the battle axe damage that Bleegs uses a better weapon. Uh, 1d8 plus 2 slashing. So he's not going to be as tactical. He's just going to know that he does a lot more damage. When he gets in there and hits, he hits to kill. So Bleegs is definitely the heavy hitter, and Crags is a little bit craftier in combat. So notes. I'm actually going to wait and come back to for a second. So now I am going to go into the warg. That's 341 in our monster manual, which I think this is kind of cool. It's got a goblin riding the warg. Spot on, spot on. So this is going to be our wargs, and we're going to call these ones for crags. He's going to call his jumper, and then Blegs is going to call his biter. And then I'm going to kind of emulate jumper and biter. This is Blegs and Crags. Just so I can keep them organized on my table. Uh, let's see, these are Large Monstrosity, also Neutral Evil, Armor Class is 13, which is natural, their hit points, they've got 26, or 4d10 plus 4, so 44 as their max, I'm going to write that there, their speed is 50 feet. So I'm going to go back up here with this riding of 50 feet. Because they're going to be riding, they're going to be using the warg's speed while they're mounted. And only use their foot speed if they get knocked off. Which should be a little bit harder because they have animal handling as one of their skills. So these are all going to be the abilities right out of the book. We'll just give them a little bit more personality. Give a little bit of a story behind it. Because when you spend the time doing this type of thing, you're more apt to make your encounters less just tactically turn after turn of just straight combat. You're not creating a throwaway encounter, which sometimes you'll need to, sometimes you'll want to. but. For this aspect, we want to look at characters for the GM to actually enjoy and have fun with and look at how can he keep these alive, just like the players are going to be looking at how can they keep their players alive. So it's going to allow a lot more opportunity for a GM to actually role play as a character when they spend this little bit of time doing these bigger encounter parts or components. Um, so let's see, I got way off track there. Perception plus four. 
They have dark vision, 60 feet, and passive perception of 14 languages, warg, and goblin. And these are only one half CR monsters. They do have keen hearing and smelling, uh, which gives them advantage on wisdom, perception, checks, relying on sight and sound. Oh no, that's hearing and smell. Jeez Louise. So, smell and sound. Actions, they get a bite attack. Now the cool thing about this is your goblin is going to have two attacks. So his first attack and then a second one at disadvantage. And at the same time, your ward can attack and they can attack the same figure depending on you know how they are in combat you know, if you think about uh, your ward here is a large beast you know generally they would take up four squares if you put them on a large uh, component depending on how you lay it out but if you have the goblin attacking a figure and the warg is adjacent to it within five feet they'll be able to attack so starting to look a little bit more for how we can utilize crags especially in combat um, well both leagues as well because he's going to want to get up there to hit so their bite um, it works as a melee uh, which is a plus five to hit five foot reach one target uh, their hit is 2d6 plus 3 piercing and if target is a creature must succeed on a DC 13 strength save Or be knocked prone which is pretty nasty because then if the goblin jumps down to attack or the wolf gets their second attack it could be pretty bad for your PCs um, so that's all the stats that actually goes by pretty fast when you're doing this process now we want to utilize a little bit of building for encounter setup and how we can make these creatures a little bit more different and memorable from just our standard throwaway goblins. So I'm going to, in my notes, pop on here a little bit of information. First I'm going to go ahead and give them their treasure so they don't have much. Let's roll and see because they are going to be individuals. A 34. Not much. 17 copper pieces each. So they don't have a whole lot of treasure on them. And I would actually go through and jazz that up a little bit. We'll do that here in a moment. But for the notes. Crags and Bleags are the, we'll say, twin eldest sons of, um, I should pull up another goblin name. Who is going to be my goblin king or queen? Maybe we'll generate both because... 
now that I'm thinking about how this, how I can utilize this encounter in my upcoming campaign, one of the areas I want to have a little bit of dungeon delving um, at fourth level uh, it definitely plays into a goblin lair. So we're going to do this again. We're going to say, um, I like this one here. Trag and, um, well, I want to avoid meth. Let's try a different one. Uh, hmm, boy, those female names are a little bit funkier. Shrelk. Uh, the Goblin leaders in the area. Constantly trying to outdo each other. These two have begun to raid and we'll say hunt in parentheses, hunt the nearby woods to prove they are the better goblin leader as I'm creating the campaign that we're doing on Monday nights I know already I'm going to have encounters in the woods I'm gonna have a dungeon delving uh, piece in the hills at fourth level so this plays right into my third level encounters the goblins from the hills um, have kind of begun to attack in the woods, which is driving some of the woods creatures into the sewers. In this case, it's cultists uh, that used to have a lot more safe haven in the woods. These goblins are coming in and causing all kinds of havoc, causing them to stick closer to their homes and a little more secure in the sewers beneath the town. So it's all playing together really well in the overarching story. This is all about vulnerability of the meek for the theme of this tier of adventures for first, second, third, and fourth. And these goblins going through and um, basically trying to push their strength and show their power and uh, reach from their hillside areas into the forest is again playing on that aspect of, um, you know, power over the meek. So it plays up really good. And these goblins here, uh, of course, the one being a little more sly, the other one hitting a lot harder, uh, is definitely going to be a regular challenge for any party. But on the wolves, and depending on the makeup of my party, I could have some foot soldier-ish goblins that are their followers along with it to make great encounters. And to set up the piece, it doesn't have to be a single encounter. So we're looking at a third level piece. Uh, if I have them kind of in the background watching as they send some goblins in to harry the party who's, uh, you know, exploring, seeing what's going on in the woods, um, I can have these uh, goblins play a kind of a recurring role just on the edge you know, as the party is in their level one going through the uh, canals, clearing out the canals, uh, one thing I can drop is some information on these two goblins on wolves in the woods. Um, so I'm able to start laying these out to be a big impact for that adventure when they get into third uh, level and confront these goblins with their minions and then actually have to get these goblins at fourth level in the goblin lair so it's a recurring character that I can keep using. And some of this aspect, again, depending on how the players interact, I mean, they may try to chase them down uh, right after they hear about them. It's hard to say, it's hard to know as a GM. Um, and that's where sometimes we have to decide where we're gonna put rails and barriers, how we're gonna keep these guys alive long enough to become 
that final confrontation or a big confrontation anyhow maybe not the final confrontation but a recurring theme through first second third and then ultimately a climax with them at fourth level that's my goal for these uh, fellows crags and bleeds um, again goblins sometimes don't seem all that difficult of encounters but when you're seeing something like I did just seeing these two sitting next to each other in the box it really got me thinking who that could be a great challenging encounter they make me think of of uh, yeah brothers who are you know at first I was thinking about working together to overthrow their parents kind of deal but thinking about that neutral evil thing they're all in it for themselves not each other they could care less about each other in as much as they need each other to kind of survive as well so a great encounter all based off of or a great number of encounters all based off of two miniatures and it leads to more because they've got a little bit more to them as these goblin brothers bosses not just goblins so i can have regular goblins go through and harry the party uh, throughout a couple of levels and really be a bigger menace than just a single encounter with goblins as i'm trying to put something together so a lot of opportunity um let's go over i'm wow we really went through that one fast let's go over these a little bit in how i would paint them so i'm going to bring them up to the camera quite a bit so we can talk about them um, they really don't have a whole lot to them so the wolves i'm probably just going to paint pretty standard for wolves even though they're wargs um, i still like my wargs to look pretty similar to wolves just to have that tie-in they're just massive wolves so their coloring is going to be very similar to what I paint my regular wolves as. Uh, the goblins themselves uh, definitely are going to be goblin green. Uh, I think it's a pretty easy piece. Yellow eyes will paint on there. Now they do have kind of tusks coming out the bottom of their mouths. Uh, actually, both of them do. Um, I suppose maybe those could be coming out the top. It's hard to say. For certain, I can't really tell. Uh, the light just isn't doing it justice on camera, but they've definitely got some uh, some type of toothiness about them. Um, no body hair, really. They don't have any hair on their heads, on their arms, uh, chests. Uh, just pretty, pretty basic. Uh, they do have a little bit of... Um, like loincloth so I'll probably paint those in like leather uh, belt I'm going to do that as like a red leather uh, boots I'm gonna do like a softer leather uh, this guy does have kind of a um, bandolier almost holding up his belt so I'm gonna just match that to the kind of red leather belt uh, weapons they do have little bits of chips and everything I'm probably going to paint their weapons very gleaming edged so a lot of non-metallic metal silvers uh, basically grays blues and grays uh, for the edge but i'm going to rust these up pretty good because they do have big nicks in them sculpted into them um, the axe here a little bit of rope on the heft to hold it in place and then because i'm going to be using these on tabletop i probably am not going to put in um, much effort on the bases. I am probably just going to dry brush those as cobblestones so I can use them in uh, my urban pieces as well when I'm going through and creating some aspects for goblins invading a small city or a town, anything like that. But my goblin brothers, Crags and Bleegs, both of them now ready to go. Uh, the challenge about this is it adds two miniatures to my to-do list. Um, but it, again, I think is going to be a great uh, encounter that I'm going to be able to run and ultimately use it a couple of times. So I could have these fellows escape out of that goblin den 
and use them even later in the campaign um, or in future campaigns as the sole survivors of the areas. So the overall aspect of finding inspiration based off of miniatures, I think these ones were actually a pretty good one. My other thought was maybe a Cyclops, um, but it looked like a pretty standard Cyclops. So I wanted to go with something that could drive me a little bit more creatively. Um, I don't see any questions or anything in chat. Uh, so we may actually end this show a little bit earlier. Let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think for the goblins, crags, and bleags. Would you be interested in playing in a campaign where you have these goblin bosses as kind of recurring villains in these lower level pieces? Um, is that something where you feel a character would uh, ultimately kind of get their teeth sunk into righting wrongs or uh, confronting these nefarious villains of this area in these woods and in these hills. Um, it, would you utilize something like this in your games if you were having to uh, create some encounters and look at recurring stories and elements in your games? What do you think of the process of changing them a little bit to make them a little more able to hold animals? Do you feel that's game breaking? Well, I don't. Again, I think you're uh, free to make the villains as, as challenging as possible to offset the characters who are going to be choosing feats and upping abilities when they can. Um, it, would you do something different other than just changing the animal handling and then the weapon, what would you do? Don't hesitate, leave me a comment. Now next Wednesday, we're going to go back to characters. So um, this is it for the villains for a few weeks anyhow. I try to pop one of these on here every now and then. But uh, characters back again next week. Just as a quick update where we're at on some of the ones. We did a barbarian, he is being painted. So currently under the brush, we did a ranger that uh, actually we used it as a fighter and um, also getting painted. <coughs> Excuse me. We did a druid now painted and on my Instagram. Be sure you check out my Instagram. We also did a dwarf fighter also painted and also on my Instagram. Um, and so we're catching up on a lot of the miniatures that we have to paint. Still looking for ideas if you think it would be a good idea for us to uh, utilize the miniature and the character sheet that we use as a giveaway. Um, should we raffle them? Should we sell them? Open for your input. Don't hesitate. Leave me a comment. Drop me some type of an indicator of what you'd like to see us do with these basic pieces that we're putting together every Wednesday. Um, Depending on feedback will determine whether or not we keep doing this craziness and how long we keep doing it. Uh, alternates, we may just end up going through and doing some miniature painting. Who knows? Uh, just because I don't want to get so many on the shelf with their character sheets or with their monster encounter sheets that uh, I run out of room for myself. So drop your comments, drop your thoughts, give me ideas, and uh, let me know if you find this enjoyable and if there's a difference in format or anything that you think could make this even more enjoyable going forward. So thank you for tuning in. If you're catching us live, if you are catching the VOD, again, make sure you give me some comments and feedback back so I know how we can better build a community and offer information and insight and ideas and inspiration that is beneficial to you in your gaming experience. Until next show, which is going to be fr Friday when we do a review, have a fantastic evening. Have a great game night if you're gaming tomorrow like I am, and we'll see you when we review. Bye-bye.